Eureka! In this video, we take a look at the principles of management of heart failure. But first, let us take a quick look at the classification of heart failure. Heart failure can be classified based on the ejection fraction into heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, mildly reduced ejection fraction, and that with a preserved ejection fraction. Most studies on pharmacotherapy and heart failure in the past were based on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There has not been definitive evidence of treatment that improves mortality in patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, but this is an area of exciting research at present. Heart failure can also be classified based on the severity of symptoms. This classification system is known as the NYHA classification. At stage 1, patients are asymptomatic. At stage 2, patients have breathlessness on moderate exertion. At stage 3, the breathlessness progresses to occur even with minimal exertion, and at stage 4, patients are breathless even at rest. The principles of management of heart failure are to first involve patients in their care, to counsel them on fluid restriction and medication compliance, two, to take on a multidisciplinary approach comprising effort from heart failure specialists, nurses and pharmacists who have a wealth of experience in managing these patients, and three, to institute medical management of patients which can be broadly divided into pharmacotherapy and cardiac devices. Now, let us take a look at the principles of management of heart failure in the acute setting. When a patient with acute pulmonary edema is brought into the emergency department, you can imagine that this patient is likely to be very breathless and in distress. The emergency department physician is likely to start treatment with IV diuresis and assess how unwell the patient is. Respiratory distress, low oxygen saturations, tachycardia, and evidence of respiratory failure on the arterial blood gas are signs that you're dealing with a very unwell patient. Now let's say that you've done an arterial blood gas on your patient and the results come back as such. This patient is very unwell. There is hypoxemia, there's hypercarbia, and there's acidemia. And if your patient has not responded to initial treatment with IV diuresis, this patient should be offered high dependency care or intensive care if the patient is a suitable candidate. In the critical care unit, Patients would be offered non-invasive ventilation in the form of BiPAP or CPAP, or they may be offered invasive ventilation. The common thread between these different modes of ventilation is to basically provide a positive end expiratory pressure, also known as PEEP. PEEP works by recruiting collapsed alveoli, opening up the airways, and even redistributing liquid within the lungs. Collectively, these measures nearly always increases the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, and it also reduces the mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. This improves ventilation and reduces the work of breathing for the patient. Now, let us imagine that the patient has recovered sufficiently and is no longer in respiratory failure after his stint in the critical care unit. He is now transferred to the general ward. The principles of management of heart failure in the general ward are to continue diuresis and to monitor progress by measuring the weight of the patient, the input-output chart of the patient, and also monitoring for complications such as electrolyte imbalances and acute kidney injury by checking on the use and ease of the patient. In the chronic management of heart failure, the superhero medications that have proven mortality benefit to patients with heart failure are ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and spironolactones. Digoxin has no mortality benefit to patients, but has been shown to reduce the risk of readmissions in patients with heart failure. ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are prescribed to all patients with heart failure at all NYHA stages of heart failure. Spironolactone has usually been shown to be effective in patients with NYHA stage 3 and 4 heart failure. In patients who cannot tolerate ACE inhibitors due to a side effect of cough, for example, and beta blockers in combination, ISMN and hydralazine used in combination is a suitable alternative that has been shown to be as effective in patients with heart failure. This benefit is especially so in patients with NYHA class 3 or 4 symptoms and patients of Afro-Caribbean ethnicity. 
In patients who do not achieve adequate heart rate control on maximal doses of beta blockers, the addition of ivabredin is an option. Ivabredin slows the heart rate by inhibiting the cardiac pacemaker current, also known as the funny current of the heart. These patients should be in sinus rhythm with an ejection fraction of less than 35%. The addition of ibuprofen has been shown to reduce the risk of hospitalizations in patients with heart failure. The latest superhero to join the crew is AZ inhibitor version 2.0, also known as Entresto. Entresto is an ARNI. ARNI stands for angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. It comprises the ARB, falsetan, and the neprilysin inhibitor secubitril. The discovery of ARNIs was a huge deal to the heart failure community because it was the first new drug with not only proven efficacy but superior efficacy to AZ inhibitors in nearly four decades to have entered the heart failure market. In patients with NYHA stage 3 and 4, ARNIs have shown to increase mortality benefit over AZ inhibitors. It also reduces the risk of recurrent hospitalizations in patients with heart failure. There are ongoing studies looking at the benefits of ARNIs in patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, which to this date has no proven efficacious treatment. Apart from medications, cardiac devices have also been shown to improve symptoms and mortality in heart failure. Cardiac devices include cardiac resynchronization therapy alone, or CRT, implantable cardioverter defibrillators, or ICD, or cardiac resynchronization therapy with a defibrillator function, known as CRTD. Cardiac resynchronization therapy does exactly what the name suggests. It synchronizes the contractility of the heart. Patients with advanced heart failure tend to have conduction system disease of the heart. Such conduction abnormalities may cause an inefficient left ventricular contraction, uneven left ventricular wall stress, increased myocardial oxygen consumption, and increased mitral regurgitation. In studies of heart failure patients, conduction system disease is associated with increased symptoms and a poor prognosis. Cardiac resynchronization therapy has the potential to normalize these abnormalities, thereby improving patient outcome. CRT has consistently been shown to improve symptoms and exercise capacity in patients with heart failure. ICDs are implanted in the right ventricle of patients at high risk of sudden cardiac death due to heart arrhythmias. When patients have a life-threatening arrhythmia, the ICD delivers an electric shock to help restore a regular heartbeat. A CRTD differs from an ICD in that it has a second electrode over the left ventricle of the heart to help synchronize a patient's heartbeat and improve cardiac function. These are the indications for cardiac resynchronization therapy or ICD placement. CRT is typically instituted for patients with NYHA class 2 to 4 symptoms, an ejection fraction of less than 35%, a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds, or a QRS duration of more than 150 milliseconds with a left bundle branch block. The QRS duration is important in patients with CRT because the QRS duration is indicative of underlying cardiac conduction disease. ICD placement is indicated in patients with NYHA class 2 to 3 symptoms, an ejection fraction of less than 35%, and at least more than one year of survival or at least 40 days post myocardial infarction or a previous cardiac arrest. These are risk factors that potentially increase the rate of cardiac arrhythmias, which may be malignant in a patient. These are the NICE guidelines for ICD or CRT placement in patients with heart failure and injection fraction of less than 35% as classified by NYHA class and QRS duration. As this talk draws to a close, I'd like to just share a few pointers with regards to new developments in heart failure. The first being the administration of IV iron. IV iron is clinically indicated in patients with an ejection fraction of less than 40%, ferritin level of less than 100, and transferrin saturations of less than 20%. IV iron has been shown to increase the six outcomes in the six minute walk test, as well as improve symptoms in patients with heart failure. 
The next quick update is the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, empaglifosin and dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure and diabetes. These agents have been shown to reduce cardiovascular deaths and events in patients with heart failure. Thank you for watching. Check out Eureka for more videos such as these. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe.